As World War I changed warfare on the ground forever, a new kind of battle was unfolding in the air. At the beginning of World War I, the aircraft was only 11 years old. But these new machines quickly found their niche. Fitted with cameras, they became spies in the sky, plotting artillery targets and troop movements. Neither side wanted their enemy to have this crucial intelligence. The solution was to replace the camera with a gun, turning passive airplanes into weapons with one purpose, to shoot down enemy aircraft. The Allies' greatest weapon in their battle for air supremacy was this plane, the Sopwith Airplane Company's Camel. King of the Allied fighters, it shot down more aircraft than any other fighter in World War I. This was Germany's response. From the Fokker Aircraft Company came the DR-1 triplane, the Camel's most famous rival. But which fighter was best at dominating the skies? To find out, the Fokker and the Sopwith are going back into the air. At the beginning of the war, enemy spotter planes were powerful weapons, the spy satellites of their age. Taking them down was an obvious military priority. They didn't want them to be able to watch them maneuver, so they had to shoot, uh, went up and tried to shoot them down. But engaging in aerial combat was a brand new game, and pilots had no experience in how to bring down other airplanes targets that could be traveling at speeds as high as 100 miles per hour. Pilots tried everything from trailing barbed wire along behind the airplane to carrying duck guns, pistols, rifles. All of them were very difficult to aim, didn't have a killer effect when they got there, and weren't very effective in taking out other aircraft. In one instance, there is some evidence to suggest that a pilot took to lobbing half bricks at his opponent uh, in an effort to actually hit the pilot and incapacitate him. They needed a focused weapon, a flying machine gun to reliably down the enemy. With the birth of the fighter plane, a furious arms race quickly developed. Soon the air was filled with these flying guns. For the reconnaissance crews fighting this new kind of war, the skies turn deadly. The one that shot us down, he come out of the sun. Every third bullet was a tracer bullet. You could see him coming like this, and you think, oh, the next one must hit me. And of course, bullets had hit the engine. So we just sailed down like this, looked for a nice field, landed on the field, Hit a ditch and over we went. Fighters were the only way to protect reconnaissance aircraft. Slow and stable, they made easy targets. To get to these spy planes, opposing fighters would have to battle it out with each other first. In order to attack the reconnaissance aircraft and shoot them down to blind the enemy, we're going to have to fight our way through the enemy fighters who are protecting them. The measure of a fighter's ability would be how good it was at shooting down enemy fighters. The power of these fighters' weapons were vital to its success in World War I. But both sides had equally good machine guns, so air supremacy was decided by the performance of the aircraft. Pilots won battles with a fighter that had superior speed, could climb fast, turn fast, give better visibility, and respond quickly. You want the aircraft to react instantaneously to any kind of a input that you make to the either the stick or the throttles or the rudders in order to maneuver as aggressively and as rapidly as you can in order to get your nose on for that first shot opportunity in a visual flight. Did the Allied Sopwith Camel or the German Fokker triplane best combine these sometimes conflicting requirements in order to produce the more aggressive and deadly fighter? The difference between success and failure came down to aircraft design. 
A well-designed fighter could give a combat edge simply by being harder to shoot down and therefore less vulnerable. It's a major consideration for all fighter pilots. Vulnerability is something that we do not want to have. We want, obviously, the enemy to be more vulnerable than us. And we do that nowadays through modern technology, through stealth technology and taking advantage of computer uh, technology, incorporating that into our missiles and our radars. Stealth technology and computers weren't available in World War I, but the designers at Fokker found their own ingenious alternative that solved a fundamental flaw in the traditional airplane designs, like the British Sopwith Camel. The Camel used the same basic technology as the Wright brothers, relying on a complex network of bracing wires to hold the aircraft together. Simply shooting them away could destroy the plane. Well, the bracing wires uh, on the Sopwith Camel uh, were very important because they uh, gave it its structural strength. Um, the problem is the enemy was able to shoot them uh, with machine guns and break them, and once they broke them, obviously the aircraft structurally just disintegrated. The Fokker Company's World War I equivalent of stealth technology was a new wing that didn't need the exposed bracing wires at all, making the German Fokker harder to shoot down than the Allied Camel. The big advantage is kind of like armor, same type concept. It hardened the aircraft or it made it less vulnerable uh, to enemy attack. So it could take battle damage, essentially. In terms of vulnerability, the Fokker is superior. The Camel's wire-framed wings made it an easier target than the futuristic wire-free wings of the Fokker. But to claim victory, being less vulnerable was not enough. A winning fighter clearly had to perform better in the air. And one of the most critical advantages a fighter can have is a better rate of climb. In an aerial battle, a height advantage over the enemy could be decisive. If you've got altitude, you have got much better visibility and you've got speed. If you can see the other guy underneath you, you peel off, you go into a dive, your speed goes through the roof. You are coming down at a rate of knots. The ideal was you come down on the tail where he can't see you, get underneath, come up and rake the belly of the aeroplane with machine gun fire. And the guy doesn't even know what killed him. Once again, the Fokker is superior. With more wings than the Camel, it generates more lift, so it can climb faster. In fact, even though it's called a triplane, the Fokker didn't stop at three wings. There are technically four, known as aerofoils. It's often referred to as a quadruplane. The actual aerofoil section between the axles is actually calculated in the lift area of the wings. And uh, so it just provides quite a, quite a fair amount of lift off that aerofoil section. Yeah, so that's its fourth wing. The four wings on Germany's Fokker DR1 triplane generated an astonishing amount of lift, giving it a climb rate nearly one and a half times as fast as the Allied Camel. Its sturdy design and faster climb rate were critical advantages for the Fokker in a dogfight, but not nearly enough to ensure victory. Because if a pilot wanted to stay on the tail of an enemy aircraft and shoot him, his aircraft would have to be more maneuverable. To accomplish this, the best fighter aircraft had to sacrifice stability, the plane's tendency to fly straight and level, for better maneuverability. It's vital to get this balance between stability and instability just right. With a fighter aircraft, you want it as unstable as you possibly can so that it has a, the ability to maneuver very quickly, but not so unstable that it becomes out of control. This trade-off is still applied to the designs of the most sophisticated fighters in the air today. Nowadays, if we look at the fly-by-wire control, the aircraft are so unstable that without the input of a computer to control the aileron and the flying surfaces, those aircraft would not be able to fly. To make an aircraft stable, designers rake the wings upwards. This upward angling is called dihedral and can clearly be seen on the bottom wing of the camel. If the plane rolls, the wing going downward generates more lift than the wing going upwards, which tends to right the aircraft, making it more stable. 
Compare this with Germany's Fokker DR1. Its wings are absolutely straight, with no dihedral and no inherent stability, making the Fokker a very maneuverable fighter, but like many of the greatest fighters, a very twitchy machine to fly. It's a bit like balancing a billiard ball on the end of a billiard cue. So um, you constant jostle all the time when you're flying the airplane. A little bit like flying a helicopter, whereas if you take your hands off the controls, it'll just wander off straight away and you, you've got to pick it up again. So it's an airplane that you, you don't take your hands off it. Yeah, if you do, well, it'll, things happen very quickly. This instability or twitchiness made the Fokker a more dangerous dogfighter than the Sopwith Camel, if the pilot flying it had enough aggression and skill. The obvious example is someone like Manfred von Richthofen, who absolutely adores the triplane from all the evidence we can see. He has more than one example. The most famous one, of course, is the one that's painted bright red, but in fact, there are times where he has five or six aircraft for his personal use. With 80 kills to his credit, Richthofen, known as the Red Baron, was the war's greatest fighter pilot. It's hard to imagine a better endorsement of the Fokker DR-1's abilities. It was less vulnerable, faster to climb, and more agile. The Germans may have thought that the camel's position looked hopeless. But in the regular dogfights between these two planes, the camel had its own answers to the Fokker's technical edge. In World War I, Germany's Fokker DR-1 triplane may have seemed to have had the Allied Sopwith camel beaten hands down. But for all its technical advantages, it was weak in a key area of fighter design, visibility. Visibility is critical in a visual fight because you can't fight what you can't see. So you have to almost have 360 degree visibility in order to maintain visual contact with the enemy and then maneuver your aircraft to gain the offensive advantage and shoot him. The Fokker's technical edge relied heavily on its unusual three-winged layout. And it was these very same wings that impaired visibility. In the case of the Fokker triplane, the pilot has serious difficulty in actually seeing past the wings when he's trying to work out where aircraft he's fighting are. And of course, failing to see your enemy can be an absolutely fatal problem. The two wings on the camel were sighted wide apart well out of the pilot's line of sight, making it easier to target the enemy and harder for the Fokker to sneak up on him. And if the Fokker pilot survived combat with a camel, his problems with visibility were not over. The Fokker could be fatal to its own pilot without any help from the enemy. It was so difficult to land that doing so could actually be more hazardous than fighting in the skies. As the tail comes down, the wings block the view ahead completely. When you're landing this airplane, it's a bit like closing a Venetian blind in front of you. It's exactly that, because uh, not only do you close your, your field of view, you're also closing off the airflow over the tail surfaces. And the moment the wings close in front of it, you can't steer it. Visibility was so poor in the Fokker that it was one of the few aircraft that could not be landed looking straight ahead. But often you can actually see where you're going in front. You can look out to the side and actually around behind you, you can actually see which way you're going. The camel's widely separated wings made the rudder very dependable, and the pilot could actually see where he was going during landing. This was a major advantage for the camel. World War I landings and takeoffs were a hazardous business. Our landing and taking off in World War I were as dangerous, if not more so, than combat. They lost about the same number landing and taking off as they did actually in combat. In or out of combat, visibility was always one of the Allied Camel's ace cards over the Fokker triplane. It gave Camel pilots a killing edge. By the time the German DR-1 and the Allied Camel arrived in the skies above Europe in 1917, more powerful airplane engines were pushing combat in the skies faster and higher. Both planes could top 100 miles per hour, and the combat ceiling had stretched to an altitude beyond 20,000 feet. Life for the pilots became increasingly difficult. 
I have a great deal of respect for the World War I pilots. They were such a simple aircraft, open cockpits, no instrumentation, very little armor on the aircraft, no oxygen systems, cold uh, environments in the open cockpit, flying in all kinds of weather conditions, flying at high altitudes without supplemental oxygen. This thin air could be as cold as minus 40 degrees, making hypothermia just as deadly to World War I pilots as enemy aircraft. We had silk socks, silk pants, silk undershirt, woolen socks, woolen pants, woolen shirt. Then you had your uniform trousers, coat, and then on top of that, your flying suit, which was fur-lined. And even then, at 20,000 feet, you feel damn cold. The improving engine performance, driving planes to these extreme altitudes, was also making them faster. And for fighters, being faster could make the difference between killing or being killed. A speed advantage enables you to catch your opponent up if he's some distance ahead of you. It also, of course, means that you can disengage from your opponent relatively easily. A pilot's maxim for many years, from the middle of the First World War through to the probably even the late 1960s, simply was speed is life. And that is why fighter pilots view speed as being so important. But there was a problem. To go more quickly, aircraft have to push the air out of the way faster. The faster a plane goes, the harder this gets, an effect known as drag. You can't get away from drag. Drag increases exponentially with speed. The faster you go, the more your drag it becomes. What this means is that going twice as fast needs four times the engine power. So the lower the drag, the faster the aircraft will go with a given engine. Unfortunately for Fokker, some designs start out with more drag than others. Long slender wings make for less drag, but short thick wings make a lot. The type of wings that make the DR-1 so maneuverable also slowed it down. And the more wings there are, the worse the drag problem gets, the slower your aircraft will be. Pitted against the Allies' two-winged camel, drag killed the four-winged Fokker. The uh, Fokker DR-1 with the three wings, essentially four, uh, creates a lot of lift, so it climbs real well, as the Red Baron attested to. The problem is, it generates a lot of drag. A Fokker triplane is a very draggy machine. You are very limited what you can do with that aircraft. You can put a thousand horsepower on the front of an airframe, and, and you won't go any faster. Whereas with a camel, less drag, more speed. In a sprint, the lower drag camel ran circles around the Fokker, beating it by a good 15 miles per hour. If you want to win in the air, you've got to out-sprint your enemy. Another battle-winning advantage for the Allied camel. This should not have been all bad news for the Fokker. All those wings may have made it slower in a straight sprint, but they were meant to give it an edge in a dogfight. Unfortunately, this was not the advantage that it appeared to be, because good fighter pilots never got into a dogfight out of choice. The reality is, is in combat, we want to avoid a dogfight if we can, because to use a sailing analogy, it's like throwing out a boat anchor and getting slow and anchoring yourself in the air for all the other enemy fighters to be able to see you, and it makes you very vulnerable. This idea of knights of the air almost jousting in the First World War is actually quite mythical. The most simple way of ensuring victory is to make sure that your opponent never sees you and you shoot him in the back. Nothing particularly chivalrous about it, but that's the simple way. Get in, hit the enemy, shoot him down, and get out of the way before someone does the same thing to you. For the Germans, building a better dogfighter was not enough to secure an advantage. The Fokker DR-1 was crushed on speed as well as visibility. It simply could not control the fight. And as more powerful engines arrived, the Camel's aerodynamic advantage over the Fokker simply increased. 
It might seem like bad luck that the Fokker company fell victim to the limitations of triplane design. But the problems were certainly familiar to their rivals, the British designers at Sopwith. Because in 1916, they had made their own, the Sopwith triplane, affectionately known as the Tripe. This remarkable three-winged plane had been so capable that it caught the attention of the German high command, who demanded their own. But when the Fokker company laid down the plans for their first triplane, they made a fatal miscalculation. Although they build the DR-1 as a result of the influence of the triplane, they do not actually use any captured examples or crashed examples to give them clues as to how they do this. They go off and build an aircraft very much of their own making. Fokker designers clearly thought that three wings could give an advantage in aerial maneuverability. But that's not why the Sopwith triplane was so good. Its third wing was actually intended to provide better visibility one of the Fokker's biggest failings. The theory, which seems amazing these days, was that they wanted better visibility. Um, the Sopwith Pup was the immediate predecessor to the triplane. The triplane has the exact same wing area, but spread over three wings. And that meant that the width of the wing was two thirds of the size of the Pup. The thinner wings blocked less of the pilot's view, giving him more chance of seeing the enemy. Designers at Sopwith already understood that drag meant triplanes were a dead end, which is where the camel came in. Sopwith sees the triplane as being an answer to a problem that exists at a certain moment in time. They are already working on development of the aircraft that becomes a Sopwith camel. The German decision to build the DR-1 had not been made entirely on technical merit. In the end, it came down to the celebrity status of this man, Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. With 80 kills to his credit, von Richthofen was a national icon and his opinions were hugely influential. He takes over the DR-1, likes the aircraft greatly, and because of the fact he's Germany's greatest fighter ace and a great national hero, the DR-1 takes on something of an image and a position in the German air service that it might not otherwise have gained. Because of their beloved Red Baron, the Germans may have been seduced into living with the fundamental flaws of the DR-1. As World War I came to an end, the formula for winning the battle for the skies was becoming clear. If DR-1 pilots could not see the enemy, they could not shoot them down. And pilots in the faster camel could decide when to fight and when to run they had more chance of controlling the fight. And though the Fokker may have been marginally more maneuverable in a dogfight, its advantage was just not great enough. If you put von Richthofen and a clone of von Richthofen into the DR-1 and a Sopwith Camel, my sneaking suspicion is that the von Richthofen clone flying the Sopwith Camel would probably win. When all was said and done, the Camel was the greater fighter. And this is reflected in the number of planes built. Fokker made no more than 320 DR-1 triplanes. And when the war ended in November 1918, the DR-1 was out of the picture. British industry, on the other hand, built more than 5,700 Camels. And unlike the DR-1, when the dust settled at the end of the war, it was still a frontline fighter. <laughs>